Katie Books Productions presents Lenny Gray, an audio drama written, produced, and narrated by Earl Sewell. Previously on Lenny Gray. I'm telling you, it ain't as simple as that. Something ain't right in the world, Tom. Something that punched a hole in this earth and it ain't friendly. People has been dying slowly for months from that flu. Now, that flu is everywhere. When it gets a hold of you, I hear it's like wrestling with an alligator. Let me go get my rifle, Tom muttered, turning to retrieve it. That rifle ain't gonna help you now. You can't shoot what you can't see. I'm going into town to find out what's going on. I ain't gonna believe all your jibber-jabber until I see it with my own eyes. Tom reached down and grabbed his boots, which were situated near the front door. He noticed that Lenny Gray was standing behind him. Lenny, go wake up Curly. I want him to come with me. I'm going too, said Lenny Gray. Oh, what for, child? You might get sick and kill you and your unborn child, said Judge. He's right. You should stay here, Lenny. Tom agreed, and they began lacing up his boots. I wouldn't go into town if I was you, Tom. You might come back sick, Judge warned. Oh, let's talk about the devil in this house is crazy. No, y'all need me to go so y'all have somebody who believes in the Lord to help save your souls. Lenny Gray spoke up for herself and stood firm on her decision. I ain't afraid of dying. And if the devil is walking the earth like I done heard Tangy May say, I plan to meet him standing on my feet and ask him what took him so long to answer my prayers. Tom said, stepping through the doorway. Tom, Curly, and Lenny Gray boarded the wagon and rode up towards town and left Judge behind. Once they reached a row of sharecropper shanties, there was a woman on her knees, wailing with her arms stretched up towards the heavens. Tom slowed the wagon and noticed that on the porch behind the woman was a body laying motionless. In the next shanty over, a little boy, about four years old, was standing on the side of it, wearing only his underwear, crying, and wiping his tears with his forearm. Next to the little boy was an elderly woman, sitting in the rocking chair slumped over, quiet and very still. The town of Dixon Mills was on edge. Mournful voices wafted through the air from all directions. It seemed as if they had stumbled upon a battlefield of the dying. Feels like we're traveling across one of them engine barrel grounds, Tom mentioned as he saw yet another motionless body covered with a quilt. A what? asked Curly. Engine barrel ground. Elderly Quinney, your old great-grandfather, was part of the local militia in South Carolina when he was a young man. He used to tell me stories about how engines had a place where they buried people. What I'm seeing here reminds me of the stories he told. Y'all know whose that child is? Lenny Gray asked, looking over her shoulder back at the little boy crying. Nope, they both answered. Lenny Gray was about to ask Tom to stop the wagon so that she could go and comfort the boy. But an older, teenage child came out of the shanty and scooped him up. They continued onward, moving slowly, while trying to understand how in a span of a few hours the life they had known had taken such a swift and unnatural turn. What's going on, Daddy? Curly asked as he tried to process the awfulness of the sight of the dead corpses on the porches of nearly every shanty. Death is here. There's no doubt about it. It's finally here. Tom answered as if he'd been praying for this moment for some time. Does that mean the devil is here too? 
Curly asked. I believe so, Tom answered. I don't believe it, Lenny Gray said aloud. She was having a difficult time believing that the Lord had turned his back on the children he loved so much. They continued down the road and into the white section of town, where every home was ordered from the Gordon Van Tin catalog. The homes were larger, well-constructed, and the neighborhood was pristine. Something wasn't right, though. An uncharacteristic silence pressed down on the air, and that made all of them feel uneasy. The kipling of a horse and the sound of a wagon creaking interrupted the quiet. A one-armed gravedigger named John rode by with a pale green horse hitched to his wagon and two coffins in the flatbed of it. Tom, Curly, and Lenny Gray looked into each other's eyes, uncertain of what to make of the peculiarity of the moment. A black undertaker and John, the one-armed gravedigger, were rarely, if at all, in the white part of town. They continued on, and a short time later, they arrived at Sheriff Quinney's house. The three of them walked around to the back and knocked on the door. When no one answered, Tom turned the knob and the door squeaked when it opened. Uh, uh, hello? Billy? It's me. Tom. Uh, uh, you in here? Tom called out. He knew that entering Billy's house was a major violation of social custom, but the moment required him to set aside codes of conduct. He, Curly, and Lenny Gray stepped inside and stood in the kitchen where everything was neat and organized. The pots were hanging precisely from a rack, and the floor had been scrubbed clean, and the table was still set. I, 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 I ain't never been in a place as not, not nice as this here, Curly stammered. Me neither, uttered Lenny Gray. I have. I've done all kinds of work around here. I was supposed to be paid, but Billy cheated me. Tom chimed in bitterly. My brothers cheated me out of a lot of things. Why deal with them if they don't treat you right? Lenny Gray asked. No choice, Tom answered. Life just happens. I can't control or create my own life the way I see fit. That ain't the way the world works. In front of them was the archway into the dining room, and beyond that, another archway that led into the living room. They guardedly walked through the kitchen, being extra careful not to touch anything. When they entered the dining room, they glanced at the fine china cabinet, mahogany dinette set, and the fine dishes that were placed on the table. I'm nervous, Lenny Gray whispered as she looped her arm through Curly's. Don't worry, none. Curly's stammer had become more pronounced. Be quiet. Tom silenced them as he noticed something odd on the floor in the living room. He slowly walked towards four white silhouetted bed sheets on the floor. Well, I'll be damned, Tom said. Here, hold my rifle. Curly took his father's rifle and watched as Tom kneeled beside the body and pulled back the sheet to make sure that it was his dead brother. Bastard, Tom said to the pale corpse. He covered his brother's face. He checked the others to verify that they were dead as well. Come on, we gotta get out of here. Is, 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 is they dead for real? Curly asked, moving towards the door. As far as I can tell, I just don't know why they are being left here in the house to rot away. The three of them exited the house and got back on the wagon. Feeling dread swelling in her chest, Lenny Gray said, I should not have come. She began trembling and heard a small voice deep inside of her mind, warning her to turn back and head home. 
I told you that, but you wanted to come anyway. Tom argued unsympathetically. You stuck here with us now until we find out what's going on. Lenny Gray threaded her fingers together and began praying. Praying ain't gonna help us none, Lenny. So, so just stop. Curly admonished her. Where, where to now? Curly asked. We're going down the road to see my other brother, Riley. He, he don't like us. I, I don't think that's a good idea, Curly said. Least I can do is tell him that Billy's dead. Ain't no harm in that. Besides, we might be able to get some information out of him. Tom made a clicking sound with his cheek and tongue and ordered the mule to move. They slowly made their way toward Riley's house. Once there, they jumped off the wagon and were about to go to the back door when they were stopped. Where do you all think you're going? A voice asked from behind. The three of them pointed their gaze toward the ground, knowing it to be a crime to look a white person in the eye when being addressed. Just coming to tell Riley that Billy done passed on, sir. Tom answered. Riley's dead too, along with his family. Tom quickly glanced up to see who was talking to him. It was Dr. Roddy. He was a young, quality white man whose soul had not been spoiled rotten with hatred toward colored folks. Dr. Roddy, from time to time, was known to help black folks in need of medical help. He would only come around at night, so none of the white folks would know that he was a sympathizer. Tom met his gaze briefly, then looked back down at the ground. He noticed that Dr. Roddy's nose and mouth were covered with a mask. What they dove? Tom asked. Boy, ain't you and your people heard about the pandemic? Asked Dr. Roddy. No, sir. I really don't know what a pandemic is. All I know is that on our way up here, we came across a few dead bodies. Seemed like people dying without warning. Dear God, it's the spread there too. Dr. Roddy's voice trailed off to a whisper as he looked in the direction of the black section of town. Sir, if you don't mind, I'd be much obliged if you would share with me what a pandemic is, Tom asked. Listen to me carefully, all of you. A pandemic means that this sickness that is killing people is happening all over the world. Dr. Roddy could not tell if they understood him because all of them were looking at their feet. Do you understand what I'm saying? He asked. I think so. Hell has been set loose on earth. Tom answered. No, boy, that's not it. Listen, let me see if I can explain it to you better. I want to make sure that you understand. The boys who come back home from the war brought back the Spanish flu. It is so powerful that when it gets into your system, there's nothing anyone can do to stop it from killing you. It can kill you within one to three days. Tell your people not to gather in public places like a church or at each other's home and tell everyone to put on masks like the one I got on and tell them to bury their dead right away. Don't let the bodies pile up. Find you some young boys to help you dig the graves right away before the white militia forms and takes them to dig graves for white people. This flu has spread all over the world, and it's getting stronger from what I've heard. Is there any medicine for it? Lenny Gray asked. No, there isn't. And you shouldn't be around sick people if you're expecting. How far along are you? About six or seven months, I think. Judging by the size of your belly, 
in the position of the baby? I'd say your father alone than that. You should be having that baby in a day now. Lenny Gray placed her hands on her swollen belly. A lot of time had come to pass since the day she ran out to the railroad tracks to run away up north. Somehow, she had lost track of time and had not realized how many months were now behind her. Ain't no sense in worrying about the baby in your belly at this moment. Now, you folks go on back and you tell all of the coloreds what I done told you. Be quick about it and tell them that if they're sick, don't come into the white part of town. Uh, uh, Should we go back in the fields and walk? Curly asked. They wouldn't be working for anybody, boy. The Quinnies are dead. The three of them got back on the wagon and turned it around. Tom ordered his mule to move quicker. What are we going to do, Daddy? Curly asked. We're going back to Billy's house, said Tom. What for? Lenny Gray asked. Tom looked at her. He's dead. He ain't going to need his car, the money he got hidden in that house, or his moonshine anymore. Tom's eyes had ballooned with greed. We are going into his house and take what we need. Lenny, I suggest you get yourself some shoes and clothes. Billy's wife got plenty. And get some fabric so Ida can make some clothes. I know where Billy keeps extra suitcases and sacks we can put all the stuff in. We can put everything we can carry in those things. We could get killed for that, said Lenny Gray, meeting Tom's gaze. Child, can't you see the devil is doing all the killing already and I'm thankful for it. He finally answered my prayers. Why you been praying to the devil? Lenny Gray's voice trembled. Because... I told him I'd give him my soul and the soul of my generations if he killed them no good quinnies. He done took it a step further and decided to kill more than I asked him to. Why didn't you pray to God to help your heart forgive him? Because God didn't answer fast enough. It's, uh, see, Lenny, I told you, God don't care nothing about us. Lenny Gray's heart jumped in her throat. She felt lightheaded and her skin began to itch for no apparent reason. Lenny Gray remained silent as she tried to understand what type of family had she married into and if her unborn baby would come out cursed. As she sat on the wagon, bumping along and rocking back and forth, the world around her seemed surreal. This is Earl Sewell, author, creator, and narrator of the audio drama podcast, Lenny Gray. I wanted to stop in to say thank you to the listeners of the show. This show has been listened to in a number of countries, and I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the people in the following countries for listening to this podcast. And here they are in no particular order. China, the U.S., Hong Kong, Russia, Colombia, South America, Argentina, South America, Australia, Finland, Hungary, Germany, France, Ireland, England, the Philippines, Bulgaria, Italy, Canada, Nigeria, and South Africa. I don't know who you are, but I do know that you're tuning into the show weekly or bi-weekly for that matter. I know that you're tuning into this podcast bi-weekly, and I wanted to give you a personal thank you. I really, really 
appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate you for taking the time to listen to my creativity. Also, please feel free to share a link to this podcast on all of your social media websites and recommend it to friends. The second thing, if you want a little bit more about the Lenny Gray uh, podcast, I have a Facebook group that you can go and join. It's called Lenny Gray Audio Drama Podcast. It's a Facebook group. It's free to join. You can go over there and you can get some behind the scenes stuff about the podcast and a little bit more about me. I hope you will take the time to join me in that group. And the last thing that I want to share with you. Lenny Gray is just one of about 25 novels I've written. Lenny Gray is one that I turned into a podcast. I have a number of other works. Another one of my works is called Keisha's Drama. It's book one in an eight-book series, and it's a young adult series. So for those of you who have young adult readers and you want to give them some really good reading, then try out Keisha's Drama. What is about to follow is an excerpt from that novel. I hope you enjoy it. Oh, and by the way, you can download Keisha's Drama wherever books are sold via Amazon, via uh, Barnes & Noble, or Books A Million. I hope you enjoy this excerpt from Keisha's Drama. I'm really not the type of girl who likes to get caught up in a lot of drama. But sometimes I feel like drama is closer to me than my own shadow. And sometimes situations become explosive, like an earth-shattering thunderclap that comes with strong spring storm. I know that's a messed up way to think about my life, but it's true. I just saw my so-called boyfriend Ronnie at the movie theater with his arm around a girl from school. There I was at a movie by my damn self because he told me that he couldn't hang out because he had to study for a chemistry exam. He was working on chemistry, but not the type that was in a book. He didn't even see me in the darkness of that movie theater. He sat two rows in front of me. He started whispering in her ear as he fed her his nachos. When I saw him do that, I lost my cool. I jumped up out of my seat, took the lid off my slushie, walked down the steps toward them and said, you need something to help drink with that? And threw my drink on him. Then the messed up part is the fact that I had to hustle up on the money to even go to the movie theater by braiding hair for some badass kids. And not only is the Ronnie situation messed up, my whole life is messed up. And I just don't know what to do. 